Well, today on No Nonsense with Pamela Wallen, Michael Kirby, Jerry Kaplan, Hugh Siegel, nobody, absolutely nobody knows more about campaign logistics, election strategies, and of course, the vagaries of the electorate and world events, which always seem to intervene. So let's get right at it, boys and girls, shall we? Jerry, Hi. let's start with you. Why sure. are we having an election? Um, Pamela, you may or may not recall that in our previous uh, get-togethers, I've, I've confessed that I've lost a great deal of my passion and partisanship for uh, what goes on in Ottawa, much of which seems to me trivia, trivial and irrelevant. But I have to tell you that I have rarely been as angry as I am uh, in all these many years as I am at, uh, at young Mr. Trudeau for calling what I think is probably the least necessary election in Canadian history and among the most cynical and opportunistic. I'm sorry that the new governor general didn't uh, play the uh, 1926 Bing Wing game and refuse him his request to, uh, to dissolve the house and call an election. We've never needed an election less and there's never been a time when we've needed Canadians not to be divided and not to be spending every hour of every day, at least the political class, beating each other up. Because what happens in election, as uh, the boys will tell you, is that whatever the other guy says is wrong. Uh, and whatever, and they say whatever we do is wrong. And there is no such thing as a sensible, thoughtful, rational debate. Uh, and since we're faced with, uh, with problems, unlike any the world has ever seen, and I don't think I say that hyperbolically. I mean, between the between COVID and uh, the climate crisis, uh, we feel like we're in the middle of a some kind of horror movie. Uh, and in Canada, the indigenous question. Uh, there's no greater time for people to be working together, and no worse time for people to be beating each other up for partisan political reasons. Okay, I want to go to Michael on that because, in fact, that. That is one of the arguments that things were actually working with with the hybrid parliament and and people understanding that emergency measures needed to be taken. There was actually a greater level of cooperation amongst parties in, in a minority government situation that we've seen in a while. Um, so as the as the fourth wave unleashed as uh, Afghanistan descended into horror, even a worse horror, uh, with the West Coast burning and the prairies in a drought, it just, it seems a very strange decision. Well, I don't think it's that strange if you realize that every other minority government we've had, at least in our lifetime, uh, has always gone to the polls after about two years, which is what this is, it was two years last October. Uh, uh, so, um, you know, the timing isn't terribly surprising. Uh, Jerry's plea for uh, a calm, rational debate, I don't know what university lives in, but election or no election, I've never seen this, this sort of idyllic, calm, rational, nonpartisan debate that he seems to love because it never materializes. And I just think that at the end of two years, it was appropriate. We are, in spite of the fact that we do have a fourth wave, the reality is that the end of COVID is, is on the clear horizon. And the question is, where do we go from here? And that's really the issue that this election is all about. Hugh, do you want to jump in at this point? Uh, I, it was interesting to me that the prime minister said in his announcement of this election that uh, the last 17 months have been strange. We're, we're looking to figure out where to go for the next 17 months or the next 17 years, and then kind of hinted at very, very radical change that the, we, we had to redefine the world and where we were going. That seems risky too. Yeah, I, I thought there were two things about his construct which were odd, and I, I don't disagree with Michael's assessment about the opportunistic nature that forces governments to seek a mandate in a, two years in a minority when their numbers say they can get one. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would point out that there are uh, uh, chaps of some significant contribution 
to public life in Canada, um, like Mike Pearson, who went from 65 to 68, three years, during which he did an immense amount for the country on post-secondary education and universal health, for example, Canada Pension Plan. Um, and there was a chap called William Grenville Davis, who sadly is no longer with us, who um, between uh, 1977 and 1981 did a full term, even though he had a minority. So, you know, I agree with Michael, it's kind of the rule. But I'd also make the case that in some circumstances, being um, a total uh, stooge to the rule is unconstructive. And I think that's kind of where the prime minister finds himself. So when he says, Canadians have the right to have a say on what we have done extraordinarily for the last 17 months. I would say, actually, that's not what elections are about. Elections are about having a say about the future. And he has not defined in any meaningful way how the future requires a fresh mandate over that which has been given to him by successive votes in the House of Commons, where at least one other party, sometimes two other parties, have voted with him to make sure that his legislation and his budgets actually get through. And here's my worry. My worry is, and I, I never question the good faith of people in public life. I think the prime minister way down deep believes this is the right thing to do for the country. I give him credit for that. But I think we're at a period of time that Jerry has described, I think, remarkably well, where the ability of something to blow up, literally or figuratively, in a way that says nobody's in control, nobody can be in control, can have the risk of creating a, well, if no one's in control, we may as well make a change. But what, 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 what are the risks? So I think that's the risk the prime minister unwittingly has set up for himself and his liberal candidates right across the country. Now, that being said, um, you know, I've often said never, ever diminish the ability of the conservatives to steal defeat from the jaws of victory. Um, the conservatives are working very, very hard on everything from vaccination and, uh, and a whole bunch of other things to make sure that the very thin layer of glass upon which the prime minister is trotting gets thicker and thicker every day. So we're going to have to wait and see. It's early days yet. Nova Scotia is very encouraging because what it says, independent of the merits of the different party leaders in that province, what it says is the public is so prepared to make radical change because they are convinced that the people in office may not be generally in control that that could create a risk right across the country, which for those looking for political change, part in partisan terms, could be encouraging. And for those who would like to see the prime minister continue uh, with a mandate, either the same or larger, um, you know, may not be quite as encouraging. Well, like, I want to just, right, yeah, go ahead, Jerry. And then I want to go back to Michael, who's in Nova Scotia. Jump in. Uh, Hugh's moved us into uh, political territory rather than the existential territory that I'm glad to walk on these days, which saves me from having <laughs> to do anything concrete. Um, it, it, it's a real gamble for the prime minister's personal future. Uh, he can't afford to lose this. Uh, if he does, people will say, you see, you were so unscrupulous, you were so opportunistic that you're being punished for it. And even if he came second, uh, let alone third. I have no idea what the results will be, of course. Um, I, I think he'd be in a great deal of trouble that everyone would say he earned fairly by himself. Uh, and so you can say goodbye to him, which, which, which introduces a new factor into the campaign that I don't think the government's polling uh, can be tested for. Yeah, that's uh, uh, Pam, let me, let me make two yeah. comments. For six, I want to go back for a moment to one thing. Hugh said, um, because I really agree with him. Um, Bill Davis, who had been Premier of Ontario for a long time, died a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, longtime Conservative Premier, who was his chief of staff for quite a bit of time. And I just want to tell you that from my point of view, he was really one of the great Canadian statesmen of my lifetime. Uh, he always, always thought about the country as a whole played very little partisan politics. And uh, I was somewhat disappointed by the media coverage, which really failed to note, uh, just because he'd been out of power for a long time, failed to note uh, what a tremendous contribution to Canadian life 
that he'd made. So I, uh, I really wanted to emphasize that. Uh, on, this, on the second point, of course, uh, Jerry's comments about what happens if uh, the Liberals lose the election, well, the answer is very simple, actually. They will change leaders. So, I mean, uh, all of the angst that Jerry seems to worry about, about uh, the Prime Minister ought to worry about what happens if he loses. He, everybody knows what happens when a Prime Minister loses. So uh, that's kind of a, a, a foregone conclusion. Um, as for all the other... Uh, problems that uh, that Jerry raised. I think he raised Afghanistan and a couple of other things. That was Pamela. Uh, no, I think you did, Jerry. But anyway, uh, the, a, lot of, uh, a lot of those problems are going to arise during your kinds of problems, unbeknownst at the start of a campaign are going to arise. Uh, and you have to go through that and just uh, see what happens. Can I be I sentimental for a second? Uh, sorry, Pam. I just want to say yeah. that Bill Davis's contribution to me was the introduction of Hugh Siegel. Uh, that's where we met. I don't know if you yeah. remember one yeah. day in the lobby of Queens Park when you became when you were starting to work for him, and I was doing some work for uh, Fidel Castro. Uh, sorry, Stephen Lewis. Uh, <laughs> that, that's when we first met. So that's what oh, I owe to Bill Davis. There's, I, I actually want to come back to that a little later if I can, the, the generational changes that we're seeing and, and what has happened to partisan politics, which has become so partisan. In fairness, I did uh, raise Afghanistan, and you all know I feel very careful, very uh, serious about this issue. I've traveled there many times, and I think we're in a, in a very, very delicate and troubling situation. So I will come to that in a moment, but but really to Mike on the question, there you are in Nova Scotia. This is the first time that a provincial government has fallen, been replaced in the course of this pandemic. Uh, and it seemed to center on, as it often does in elections, a symbolic uh, scene. We remember the Syrian boy on the uh, beaches that kind of changed people's thinking. This is uh, a, a, a man dying in a wheelchair in the hallway of a hospital and the issue on which the conservatives was focused uh, were focused was health care. Um, so it does, I mean, this is, these, these are these pivotal issues that occur. Is it something larger than that though? Uh, no, I actually don't think it is. With one, one point you have to note though, the premier had only been premier for a matter of months. Mm -hmm. the, the premier that had won the last two big majorities uh, resigned. I mean, retired, I guess, correctly. Uh, mm -hmm. He was he was replaced by a new leader, new premier, uh, who made the mistake of going to the polls, uh, calling an election very quickly because he'd seen that every other premier who had called an election during COVID had won. But all those premiers that were simply seeking a second or third mandate, they were not uh, seeking their first mandate, which is what he was. Secondly, he ran an abysmally bad campaign, uh, made all kinds of mistakes. Uh, I don't know who was running the campaign, but uh, they should never be allowed to do it again. Um, and third, uh, it was not that the, the party itself had been in power for 16 years, or been 16 years to be correct, since the Conservatives had been in power. Um, and, you know, I was uh, saying earlier that it was uh, 16, it was 51 years ago uh, that the same thing happened in Nova Scotia, only in the reverse order. The Liberals began with four seats. Uh, the Conservatives had 42 and the Liberals still won the, the election to the total and complete shock of everybody. So I think you had a novice premier, no track record of his own, only the track record of the predecessor. The predecessor wasn't running. And by the way, 11 of the previous members weren't running either. Mm -hmm. So it was not as if you could push your team because most of the previous cabinet had just were simply not running again. Um, and the Tories ran a brilliant campaign by focusing on the one issue that historically in Nova Scotia has uh, mobilized everybody. And that was healthcare. And they focused on it with a very singular minded focus so they ran a uh, they were brilliant and the liberals frankly were abysmal 
Uh, the Afghan question, uh, let me get there. Of course, uh, everyone is saying who could have predicted this. My view of this is anybody could have predicted this. Uh, there have been signals for quite some time that this version was uh, of the world was going to unfold. When the Americans decide they're going to pull out precipitously, I was part of a a group of people that wrote a report that said you can't give your enemy an exit date because they wait you out and then, um, you know, set the bombs off. So we knew this was coming. Uh, there is criticism in the United States, criticism in the UK, huge criticism here that we have had a decade to help those who served our troops, the translators, their family, the people who worked on our bases. We've had a decade to help get them out, and we haven't. Um, Hugh, can you take this issue on? Well, let me say a couple of things. Um, let me start by saying that I think what we're seeing here is an example of the Americans, or I would say, withdrawing from the main game. Now, mm -hmm. I don't want to, I don't want to. Uh, call it a game when people's lives are uh, I, more, I get it. Yeah. more serious than that. But I mean, fundamentally, America's international role, supported by her allies, has been to make sure that there is the kind of strategic and tactical block to make sure that no other power hegemon in the world, not the Chinese, not the Iranians, not the Russians, acquires so much power that the authoritarians uh, actually take over. And those of us who happen to naively believe in democracy, rule of law, equality of opportunity, presumption of innocence, freedom of the press, all these quaint, quaint little small L liberal views, just stand back and watch the other folks tear through it all. And if you look at the Taliban, they, and you will have seen this when you were there, and I was briefed on this when I was there in 2011 with the Minister of Defense and the, and the Chief of Defense Staff, Taliban rest and are uh, resupplied and financed by Pakistan, by their security services. It's been known by everybody, yep. the CIA, our own people. It's a matter of pretty well public fact. Pakistan is the largest uh, ally in the area of the People's Republic of China, yep. largely because it's a countervail to India, which is a whole other kind of competition. So therefore, and let's let's be clear about recent history. In the last three weeks, the Chinese foreign minister met with Taliban leadership in Xinjiang province, which is sort of closer to that part of the world, to make it perfectly clear that there would be Chinese cooperation, Chinese investment. You know, we're going to look. So, and this is before there's been any public indication by the Taliban that they're not going to be quite as harsh. They're going to let, you know, maybe women work and maybe girls go to school and all of that for whatever. Don't, don't that believe means. it for a second. But Understood. Yes. <laughs> Understood. So what the Americans decided to do by pulling out, aside from saying 20 years is enough, which is intrinsically understandable, is to also say we really don't care about the Chinese relationship with the Taliban and the Pakistani support for the Taliban and what that does to that part of the world. What it does to India, which also borders on the region, which is a Commonwealth colleague of Canada and only the largest democracy in the world, however imperfect. So I think strategically that is a significant impact, especially for middle powers like Canada, who are dependent upon the larger players to keep the balance in some kind of framework of reality. So that's number one. On your point about our inability to be on the ground quickly and get people out, um, I actually have seen uh, one of the forms that were sent out to a former um, translator or interpreter or driver who worked with the Canadian forces. And, you know, I mean, once the forms that are listed are put out and you have to answer in English and French and you have to provide true copies from whatever little village in Afghanistan you happen to be hiding in from the Taliban. Uh, I just looked at it and I said, bureaucracy 10, humanity zero. And that's not who we are. And that's not who we should be. And what we should have seen, frankly, even with the security risks, is a task force, Canadian transport planes, backed up by support troops to defend the perimeter, 
and loading up those planes with all those folks who've asked to come, you may stop in Cyprus and some other place to sort out who has all the right paperwork, but right. rule number one, get them out, get them safe. Now, I have no idea uh, what the actual problems on the ground might be, and I don't want to be unfair. That being said, I think the initial response has been bureauc bureaucracy one, humanity zero, and I don't think that's who we are. And I met a lot of those guys, as did you, Pam, when you were there yeah. with the task force. And, you know, they walked around in Canadian uniforms with the Canadian flag on their shoulder, and they were absolutely essential to our troops understanding what was going on and staying alive, and also defending innocent Afghans from what the Taliban were up to. So well, they allowed us to do uh, what, what Canada did so uniquely because the Americans travel in such huge numbers and, and with their own internal uh, self-defense on, on any mission, Canadian soldiers would put down their guns and go two or three at a time into a small village uh, to figure out whether we could build the school that night or, you know, we had dual mission there. Americans couldn't do it because of, as I say, the size of their force protection. And these are the people that took us in there, who put their own families and their own individual lives at risk to see that happen. We could have been bringing them out much sooner. And let me just add one small thing, and I defer to Jerry, because Jerry's had more international experience than I have. I don't understand why when things get a little bit hairy, the first thing you do is close the embassy. I thought embassies were there for the purpose of being there when things are problematic. Yeah. They're not just there when things are going well. Now, it's always a hardship posting in Afghanistan, to be fair. But nevertheless, you know, um, our embassies should be open. We should have enough of a security presence in our own embassy to keep it safe as it does what it's doing to try and get people out. The embassy is closed. I have no idea. I guess we have officials with the military at the airport doing their best to sort through but the notion that an embassy closed when things get rough, not my idea of what public service is about. And those officials Pat, are inside Pam, the perimeter. Yeah. Okay, Mike, Pam, go ahead. Uh, just on, on Jerry's point, I, I agree with probably 90% of what he said. Uh, the most important thing he said was it was bu bureaucracy 10, uh, humanity zero. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah and I, be unfair. you know what? I don't want you to paint Jerry as anti bureaucracy. He didn't say that yet. No, that was I you, that. for sure. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, yes, no, I haven't given Jerry a chance to say that yet. That's right. Uh, no, but, ser but seriously, my immediate reaction on reading all of the papers, and this, the, the, including the stupid thing that went out at first that said they had 72 hours to reply by email when they didn't you know, have access to email. Right. I mean, that is pure and simple bureaucratic screw up. And the Canadian bureaucracy and... You know, all three of us have been around it uh, a lot. Uh, we, you and I have been in it. Uh, we know it's ultra conservative and cautious, just so we're not using a political term conservative, it's ultra cautious. And this was a time when not to be cautious. And as you said, if you don't want to fly them to Canada, fly them to Cyprus, fly them somewhere where you can screen them at, at that point. And as a Canadian, frankly, I found it embarrassing that we were so slow off the mark. Now, it looks as if we're now making progress uh, quite a bit. A couple of planes went in and out yesterday, but it's not near enough. I, I agree with you. Uh, but uh, somehow it was unfortunately a very typical Canadian response to a foreign crisis. Yeah. Jerry, I know you're dying to get in here. Uh, yeah, I want to bring a couple of new perspectives. Uh, uh, Hugh, you're right. I have spent a bit of time uh, abroad and my experience with Canadian embassies is not so good looking. Um, in a number of countries I was in, um, I knew I learned for a fact that almost nobody in the embassy ever left the embassy. Uh, they stayed in the little uh, diplomatic world that exists in, in all those uh, poor and uh, forlorn countries. Uh, and uh, in all the time I was there, in fact, only one man ever left to go out and meet the people of the country. Uh, so I'm not surprised at that blindness. Uh, number one, number two. If you blame, if it's the bureaucracy's fault, isn't that the politicians' fault? Isn't that their job to tell the bureaucrats what to do and to make sure they do it? And it doesn't seem to me that they've done that 
uh, particularly well. Number three, I want to go back to the history of uh, Afghanistan just a bit. Uh, when the Russians invaded, the first invade, first time anybody was stupid enough to try to invade that uninvadable country uh, for uh, for uh, since the Brits in the 19th century, um, the what the Americans immediately did was start uh, was start arming Russians' enemies. Russia's enemies became the Taliban, and so the so the, the Taliban's major source of the weapons was the United States government. There's even a movie uh, with Tom Hanks uh, about it, which tells remarkable truths. In fact, it's not all it's not all fiction at all. Fiction at all. Uh, secondly, um, the Americans continued to support. What was I going to say? I'm sorry, I, I forget things from time to time. Uh, the the connection with China, maybe. No, not no. Oh. But th thanks, Pam. Um, I, 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 it's the connection with Pakistan. Ah, uh, okay. Pakistan has remained to you, as you know, uh, one of uh, America's key allies as it continues to try to balance the Indian Pakistani uh, problem. Uh, but in the process, it validates or legitimizes or makes it easier for Pakistan to use what is probably often American weapons to support the Taliban. So every time you turn around, the Americans are in the middle of terrible things happening. Uh, and as you said, Pam, with, when they do go into a village, uh, they cause mayhem and, uh, and uh, destruction uh, is a good deal of the time. So they've earned the, uh, the unpopularity and the sense that they are not, they are not to be trusted. Um, but I say this for Joe Biden's decision, uh, and as it happens, you all know it was Trump's decision too, to pull out, that it, didn't, it doesn't matter whether it was three weeks or three months, and it doesn't matter whether it had to be done immediately or in two years, that the outcome had to be the same. That what we see from this, um, this astonishing disintegration of the uh, so-called uh, uh, Kabul government uh, was that uh, was that uh, it it was virtually inevitable that the uh, that the facade of government was so thin and so fraudulent that whenever the Americans pulled out now in six weeks and two years uh, the country was going to uh, yeah I agree with that I think all people were saying is if you know this is coming it's inevitable do the planning in advance. Uh, get your civilians out, get get those people who you've already verified, because if they've been your translator or driver, you've already vetted them. But and they could have come at any time. And, and their families. American, yeah. And their families. What we know from the American presence in uh, both in Vietnam, uh, uh, later in um, later in, in Afghanistan, in, in Iran, is that they never stop to learn anything right. about local custom or local culture, and they oh. don't know how they're, the people Agreed. are going to react. Agreed. Okay, can, let me just do a quick round on this. So that is a, an important discussion. Is it going to influence voters in this country? Does it go to that question about who we are and who we think we are and we should be doing the right thing? It is not going to in influence voters at all. If historically, foreign issues don't impact the Canadian election unless they involve the United States, because most Canadians don't think of the United States really as a foreign issue. It's, it's a U.S. issue, right? But I've never seen in my time around a case where a foreign issue had any significant, even any little impact on Canadian federal elections. Hugh? So I disagree with that. If you think about 2019, uh, sorry, 2015, and that uh, Syrian boy who washed up on a Turkish beach, um, which is, you know, a bit of the world invading, if you wish, the nature of our domestic debates. And the prime minister of the day responded in a fashion which he thought was compassionate, uh, but it was very much a tin ear by comparison to what Canadians would have liked to hear from their leader. And uh, the leader of the third party, Mr. Trudeau, expressed what Canadians wanted to hear clearly and precisely. And there was a very strong shift in the rhythm of that campaign and in voter intention as a result. So I would say that I think to this point in time, Michael is absolutely correct. 
And if, like the vaccines, um, our effort starts slowly, looks a little disorganized, it seems to be a lot of nervous shuffling of feet, but then it turns, as Jerry was saying and Michael was saying, and uh, there is a more um, substantive um, evacuation and planes are arriving with not hundreds, but thousands of people, then I think the anxiety which exists now will in fact dissipate. But if that does not happen, and if we see events of another kind, God forbid, um, you know, Afghani female journalists or politicians or female judges, all of whom built their lives in the last 20 years, ending up being executed or disappearing or whatever in a way which the media covers, then I think um, this could turn pretty badly for the government in charge, A, because they're in charge, it's the old Harold Macmillan rule, advance, 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 and B, the allegation will be made, you could have been moving sooner. Now, if it doesn't appear to make a serious humanitarian difference, then it will dissipate. But if there is a pop that says, wait a moment, there are lives here that are unnecessarily being lost to people who are loyal to Canada, I think Canadians will respond and they will respond negatively. But and I think another way of saying that is that it's not up to the political, the political class to make this initiative. Right. I think it's a great deal up to luck, maybe bad luck, and the media. Um, that picture of that young David who died on that beach uh, could not have been invented by, uh, by any political leader trying to make trouble for a politician. It just happened because it was there and none of us could avoid it. And once none of us could avoid it, the media continued to play it. So if something terribly comparable to you happened uh, in Afghanistan, like we found some, uh, some girls being beaten, which probably is happening, but if there was yeah. a picture of it, it could inflame things. Otherwise, I with Michael, it's not an issue that you, you can, uh, we can the, do anything about. The other thing, Pam, we have to remember about the, the issue of the picture of the boy washed up on the beach. Well, its cause was a foreign issue. Mm -hmm. the, what made it a big political issue in Canada was the complete apparent, complete lack of empathy by the prime minister. That was the issue. The issue wasn't what caused them to be washed up on the beach. It was that the prime minister appeared to not either care or be very cold in his response. And it was a kid. And so, yeah. uh, you know, so that's not, I wouldn't have classified that as as a, a foreign issue. In, yeah, no, in fair point. The election, fair. it was Wait, the prime right, minister's right. reaction. Can I connect with something we said a few moments ago about your yeah. office for the moment? Um, if you go back and see what the prime minister did and what he said and what he might have said, um, I have no question in my mind that the prime minister wanted to be both heartfelt and prudent, didn't want to make excessive undertakings without knowing the facts. He would have gone to Immigration Canada. He would have gone to, to the Foreign Affairs Ministry, as it was then called, for advice. And do you think they would have urged him to step out ahead of everybody else and put his heart on his sleeve? Not a chance. They would have urged him to be cautious and careful, express some concern, but don't get carried away. We don't want a wave of people rolling in. You could just see that coming from our friends in the bureaucracy. And I think the prime minister took too much of that advice. And I, because I actually think he's quite a humanitarian guy. And his own instincts would have been different. But part of what a prime minister has to cope with is how much advice you take, because in the end, you carry the can for whatever it is. And we're, right. we're talking about Prime Minister Harper there, but we've seen it this week with um, with Prime Minister Trudeau or Liberal leader Trudeau, as we should say quite rightly in the middle of a campaign, um, that he was advised not to be definitive on whether or not they would recognize a Taliban government. Uh, and and that cost him even in the short term. I mean, nobody can see any circumstances in which that would be acceptable. Right. That's so, a good example. Yeah, that's a very. OK, I want to come back to um, last night. And I, I don't think I'm breaching any confidences here because we were just having a nice uh, friendly dinner. But Alan Gregg, a guy who you all know and a pollster in this country for many, many years. So we inevitably got talking about politics politics and, and this election. And he made uh, an interesting point about the, the old battles used to be, you know, would 
Would the PC voter, the progressive conservative voter, switch to the liberal? Would the liberal switch to the PC? That was the core of kind of election campaigns for many, many years. Now we've got um, also many players in the in the political field, the Greens and and uh, other Western based parties and those kinds of things. Uh, but what he was talking about is is really the disaffection that we're seeing with big government, with government, with politics, with business, with capitalism, with whether democracy is working. Like these are huge issues, not just whether or not um, this guy's going to elect it or that guy's going to elect it. And and I said to him at one point, I mean, you wouldn't have even seen the squad in the U.S. under an Obama administration, and that was yesterday. And now these conversations are are quite public. Jerry, why don't you start on that topic? Gee, I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> Nobody, we don't. <laughs> that you guys were were describing. Um, I, I I told you I've lost my sense of it. Uh, yeah. Part partly it's personal. I just don't have the energy uh, anymore, and I guess the health, I suppose. Um, but it does seem to me a, a very different world from the one we were uh, involved in to, uh, to start at the beginning. Um, I could not conceivably run an election campaign anymore because of my uh, overall ignorance of technology. Right. I, I just can't keep up with what seems to be uh, a major component of everybody's campaign, stuff that I barely understand, and uh, using language that I barely understand anymore, uh, new terms that... Uh, are, are, are all a- alien to me. Uh, secondly, I don't understand a campaign during a pandemic uh, when you can't go door to door, I think. I, I wouldn't let a canvasser come in. Uh, when you can't have a rally uh, in a committee room which hypes everybody up, I think, I think this is being uh, underemphasized. Uh, these, guys, these guys are entertainers. These people are, these leaders are entertainers and they love the thrill of a crowd. They love the excitement. They love uh, feeling that emotion. And you can't find it if you don't have a crowd. Uh, and they're not, all, and I hope they don't have crowds. I'd be really angry if they did. It would be dangerous for all of us. As for your larger semi-ideological issues, gosh, I, I, I don't uh, know what to think. I, I The United States seems a uh, completely foreign something to me. Uh, I don't understand it. I don't understand a single thing about the large number of people, close to 50%, uh, who still want Trump to come back, uh, who, who are anti-vaxxers, uh, who use some of the language you just did, uh, Pam, uh, and who are prepared to uh, go and kill Nancy Pelosi uh, on the streets of Washington uh, in, a, in, a, in a completely open way. Um, this is not something I can get my uh, head into. I, it, I'm sure it's not good for all the things I've believed in all my life, but then <laughs> nothing seems good for all the things I believe in. Oh, Hugh, uh, Hugh Tackle. Well, let, me, let me say that um, I agree with Jerry's description of the turf, um, but I think the pandemic has had the following effect. And it's affect all political parties and all governments, not just those who are running in our election. Um, it has raised the core question of whether the nature of the problems we now face, whether they're biological, whether they're about climate change, uh, whether they're about the collapse of alliances around the world, uh, whether uh, they are about um, finding uh, hundreds of uh, Indian uh, children's graves, Uh, not that we didn't know they exist, but it was never quite so clear, has raised the question, I think, for a lot of thoughtful people who are not anarchists and are not crazy, um, is anybody in charge? Can anybody be in charge? Is anybody have the capacity to have some measure of legitimate directional control exercise leadership so there's a way for ordinary thoughtful people to find a way through which is all you ever look to government for and i think that um you know uh, despite uh, the really substantial landslide of president biden uh, up against that other chap um uh, you know boris's successful and surprising landslide 
in the British election. There's now a view in a lot of the, what I would call the liberal democratic world that it's not clear if anybody is in charge or can be in charge. So that produces a very, what I would call loose dynamic around elections, both about their relevance and about what people are saying as their answer to taking the country ahead in this direction or that direction as the case may be. I don't think we've seen the manifestation of that yet in the polls, but I believe we will. And it won't necessarily be because there's a wild swing from A to B or whatever. There may be a very large swing to the undecided. And that may have, depending on how they manage the election, a really serious impact on turnout. And then you get into a whole other dynamic about what is the legitimacy of a government who are elected with, let us say, 37% of 62% who showed up when the parliament thusly elected has to make some pretty tough decisions that really affect people's lives. So I think that's the kind of world we're in. And, yeah. um, and I'm kind of hopeful that uh, some of our political leadership will begin to address some of that to the extent they can. And the, the, the thing that has fundamentally changed since uh, you and Jerry and I were managing or otherwise running campaigns is the advent of social media. In the old days, what we did was we thought that if you could control the headline in the daily paper day after day after day, you know, what whatever was above the fold was terrific. People would get their information from the newspaper. They'd get it from radio and television. And that was it. What's changed is that people, that's not where people look anymore for information. They look on social media, which allows parties and other groups, not necessarily political parties, to run campaigns on social media to say things which are factually false, but nevertheless get them read by large, large numbers of people, so-called conspiracy theory, uh, theorists and others. And so the whole premise on which our, our, our election system was run, which is you lay out the issues before the people and the people will look at the alternatives from the three or four parties and then make choices, is completely shot. Because what the people are doing is looking at what the parties have said, but then they're seeing what people are saying on social media, uh, which may be diametrically opposed, is said in very simple language. They're not constrained by telling the truth. And so it makes it much, much harder to, A, build a consensus, and more importantly, guarantees, I think, uh, increasing fragmentation of the country. Now, the U.S. is the worst possible example because they were led uh, for four years by someone who exploited that, and that hasn't uh, emerged in Canada much except for in parts of Alberta. But I'm one who's very pessimistic about what happens if one of the, if say Ontario, to take an example, if one of the parties led by a leader who's prepared to ignore the truth uh, and really run the same kind of demagogic show that, that Trump did, uh, what happens if someone like that gets in? I, and we have no idea in our system of government how to deal with somebody like that. You know, you can't vote them out. You can run another election and he can still win. But it's, let me very, it, it's very difficult. Let me put this to you, and, and, and I'm in your category about how I know campaigns have changed so fundamentally with social media, but there is also an awful lot of information that is being put out on social media that is not being shared either by the campaigns or by what is called the mainstream media. Uh, we have seen for two years in this country focus on COVID as if it's the only story in the world. It is a big and important one, of course, but it's been more about the numbers and how many people in hospital and how many people got vaccinated, not the question about um, who was running the show, to Huey's point, and did they do a good job running the show, and, and all the other issues that have been completely and totally ignored in the course of that, that period of time. Hugh? Well... Let me, let me give you a, a tiny piece of history, which will tell you how things have radically changed. When uh, David Lewis stepped down as leader of the NDP, and he had been the leader of the NDP during the um, first Trudeau minority, so 72 to 74, and the NDP had done tremendous work forcing the government to make substantial policy changes in the interest of the country, to, the, to his credit. 
So there were tributes being paid on that day, as the usual, as happens, and various people spoke. And, and, um, and part of the cycle was the um, NDP had gone through a tiny challenge with something called the Waffle, uh, which was a group of New Democrats who were more to the left of the leadership, and Jerry can help us with this, who wanted more radical change. In any event, it was sort of part of them. So in the final tributes, Mr. Stanfield, who was the conservative leader, got up and he paid tribute to David Lewis. And he said, now, he said, now, David, um, Mr. Lewis, don't be troubled by having dissidents in your party. In your party, it was called the Waffle. In, uh, in, in Mr. Trudeau's party, it's called the Cabinet. And in, in my party, it's called the General Membership, right? Which, by the way produced a lot of laughter and goodwill and the prime minister himself was laughing. But here's the point. Imagine how wonderful it was to be able to actually have fun with the dissidents in that way. When in fact, the point you make about social media and Jerry makes about new technology is that, you know, there's a new QAnon or its equivalent somewhere in every political system, every 27 minutes. And, and because of the ability to self-publish without any editorial intervention, the sort of things they will say or do about a whole bunch of things, some of which may be rational, some of which may be bigoted and small-minded and, um, and anti-feminist and God knows what, is just part now of the atmosphere which our political leaders somehow have to deal with. And by definition, they have to have their own teams doing the same thing to the other side. Yeah. To be, and, and that produces the kind of uh, modest insanity, which Jerry is very lucky not to be part of. <laughs> well, we have our own insanity. Come on, don't be unfair. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll match you one for one uh, on that, you. Um, look, uh, sorry, I'm just having a little trouble uh, connecting. Uh, I, I, one of the things that bothers me most, maybe the thing that bothers me most about the uh, pull of the uh, of the new, let, let me call them the new crazies you were talking about that you didn't use that that phrase, the people who are who are uh, attracted by the uh, the ones the hue are, hue is by the uh, media the hue is talking about um, is the susceptibility of so many people to the lunacy that in my view is being pushed by those people. And I don't understand who they are and I don't understand how they got that way. And I don't understand why they're so angry and I don't understand why they're so irrational. I simply don't understand uh, an anti-vaxxer. Uh, nothing that person will say will make me understand why he or she uh, won't get a vaccination which 98% of the experts in the world tell us is what's going to uh, save us if anything is done. But, and that makes me deeply pessimistic and everything that happens around me uh, reinforces that, uh, that, that pessimism. And from that point of view, Afghanistan is just another thing that's happening. Uh, it seems to me that it has seriously undermined Joe Biden's attempt to, uh, to uh, bring Americans together which I think he would he was failing, but I think now he, uh, he it's been set back even much further, and nothing can be more dangerous to the world. Well, I guess some things can, but little can be more dangerous than having a split America uh, that gets that continues to be so angry with itself. And and Mike, Pam, just just a, a quick comment yeah. on what mm -hmm. Jerry said. I I uh, I share his pessimism, and here's why. I, in the last several weeks, I've tried to talk, I've had conversations with people who've refused and are not getting vaccinated. And I did it because I was really trying to understand it. Like it didn't make any, like as Jerry says, it's crazy, it didn't understand it. And I would engage, we would engage in a, a very civil discussion, which went nowhere. And it went nowhere simply because the person I was talking to was, uh, completely believed in, an, uh, in a, a set of what they thought were facts, which I knew weren't facts. Well, you can't have a debate with someone if there's not a, a common agreement on what's true and what's not true. And the that's, fact, that's the whole point about our politics now, it, it, which is exactly. not just vaccine, it's whether or not debt is an issue or whether, you know, there's right. uh, 
So, uh, but I tried it on on people who didn't want the vaccine just because I, 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 yeah, you know, I yeah. know the facts. And the reality is that there are what was they were called alternative facts at the beginning of the Trump's uh, Trump right. era, and. I, I mean, our whole system of democracy is based on the belief that there will be a common set of facts on which people can agree. The disagreement will come in. What do they do? Given those About facts, it. what do yeah. you do now? The fact is that there's no agreement on what the facts are. And that makes the entire situation very, very vulnerable to someone who wants to be a demagogue. Well, we should have somebody in this panel who says in reply and rebuttal, Michael, that what we've thought were facts for all these years until the trumpeters came and uh, undermined it were not in fact facts. And in fact, for, no, no, that's for, for 200 years, we, we lied to ourselves about what the history of Canada was really all about, from John A., sorry, Hugh, uh, to, uh, to today. Uh, and it certainly was true for me. I, I graduated uh, in honors history from the University of Toronto and never heard the word indigenous or colonial or Indian, ever. It wasn't taught to history students. So who learned it? Nobody learned it. But we didn't learn, like as the Americans learned nothing about slavery, although uh, what they often learned was, was the opposite of the truth. So we learned little about uh, how Canada became Canada. Uh, and, and I think it's important that our panel have somebody say something about this large constituency that now exists in this country uh, to bring these truths home. Uh, but it also, at the same time, deeply complicates, deeply complicates the, uh, the yeah. uh, political fight. And Hugh, I will give you the final word on this, which is, I mean, we can talk about alternative facts or, or all of that, but people do have very different sets of truths about how they live. We've talked about in the past, the rural urban view of the world, the male female view, you know, there just are different experiences. Well, and I, and I take Jerry's point as both uh, accurate and well-made. Um, and I, let me say this though, when you hear people use the expression and you hear them on the right, on the left, you hear them amongst our indigenous brothers and sisters, you hear them, about um, black leaders in the United States who are fighting racism, it's time for you to hear my truth, right? And it's a legitimate expression, and it's it's a way of saying whatever you've heard in the past, my truth actually counts, and I want you to listen to it because it's important. And that's the polite way to put it. Sometimes it's not put even that politely. Right. The nature of a society is not that you pick one truth or that you use one truth to beat everybody else's truth up. You have to find a way where there's common ground between those truths to build together for the future. I mean, you know, I grew up. I grew up in a home where if my mother bought me two sweaters, and I came down the stairs wearing the red one. She'd say you didn't like the blue one. So I understand guilt. I know how that works. But you cannot build a society on guilt. And we are now awash, left, right, and center, indigenous, non-indigenous, a lot of people who are purveyors of guilt. And yep. promotions of guilt, and guilt is not a solution to anything. It may yeah. be a precondition to understanding, to make Dude. Jared's point for a moment, but it is not a way to move forward. And we need leadership in this country to start saying that. Exactly. Gentlemen, yeah. Thank you so, so much. Uh, we will come back one more time before voting day, if you all should agree. Uh, but thank you for your, your thoughtful just your thoughtfulness, your experience, your insights. Great to see you all. Love you all. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Thanks, man. Man. Lots of great. See you all. Uh, see you guys. <laughs> for this edition of No Nonsense with Pamela Wallace. We'll see you soon.